right, you're live. And now I'm unmuted. <laughs> All right, uh, let me begin. Good afternoon, my name is Esther Manhammer. I'm the mayor of the city of Asheville and the chair of the governance committee. I'd like to welcome you to our meeting. And uh, just minimizing this so I can see it at the same time. Um, all council members and staff are participating virtually to help our audience Follow along, I'll state each section of the agenda aloud. We're streaming live on our virtual engagement hub, which is accessible through the virtual engagement hub link on the front page of the city's website. We also have an option for the public to listen live by phone by dialing 855-925-2801 and entering the code 3405. For today's meeting, we have the option for people to call in and comment live during the meeting. To call in and comment live, use the same number, 855-925-2801, meeting code 3405. Your phone will be muted and you will hear the meeting live. At this point, callers will hear, for more options, please press star. Pressing star three will allow callers to continue to listen live and join the speaker queue. You'll have three minutes to speak. Okay, I'm gonna go through and introduce the committee members and staff who are participating virtually. As I say your name, please say a quick hello. Councilwoman Roney. Hello. hello. Councilwoman Gwen Whistler. Good afternoon. Um, interim Assistant City Manager Peggy Rowe. Hello everyone. Assistant City Manager Rachel Wood. Good afternoon. City Attorney Brad Branham. Hello, everyone. Communication and Public Engagement Director Dawa Hitch. Good afternoon, everybody. All right, we'll begin our agenda. The first item on our agenda is the approval of the minutes. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes from October 2021, which is the last time we met? This is Kim, so moved. Okay. All right, I have a motion and a second. I'll now do a roll call vote. When I say your name, please say aye to approve the minutes. Councilwoman Roney. Aye. aye. Councilwoman Whistler. Aye. And myself? Aye. The minutes have been approved. Okay. Um, next on our agenda is initiatives on access to government. Um, this is our sole agenda item for today, and it is an update on the city initiatives to increase access to government. And Dawa Hitch will present this item. So I'm going to turn it over to Dawa. Great. Thank you, Jenna, for getting that up. And good afternoon, Mayor and Council members. I'm Dawa Hitch, and I have the pleasure of serving as the city's Communication and Public Engagement Director. Today, I'll be sharing a presentation on the city's continual efforts to enhance access to government. So before we get too far into the details, I thought I'd start with a few key takeaways. One, the city of Asheville is committed to inclusive participation in government. Two, making information accessible to the public is a guiding principle. Three, there are many current outlets for public engagement. And four, staff is committed to continuously improving options to enhance access to government with several short-term and longer-term efforts currently underway. Next slide, please. All right, there are legal requirements that relate to accessibility. Uh, first, the open meetings law, which is a North Carolina general statute that requires proper notice and the keeping of official meeting minutes for official meetings of public bodies. With respect to the proper notice, uh, regular meetings scheduled a regular meeting schedule must be established and any deviation from that schedule should be reported to the city clerk and properly noticed. Uh, changes in the regular schedule should be noticed seven days in advance and special called meetings should be noticed a minimum of 48 hours in advance. Of course, there's an opportunity for public attendance and uh, they must be open to the public unless business is being transacted via a closed session. With respect to meeting minutes, they're required for every meeting that document the legal requirements for the meeting a quorum being present and record and records the actions that are being taken. 
So in addition to the open meetings law with respect to accessibility, there's also the Americans with Disability Act policy, uh, which addresses the, there must be requests for persons with disabilities for reasonable accommodations to access city programs, services, and facilities. So currently accommodation examples include web, website translation, public input translation, and closed captioning for virtual meetings. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the specific examples for accessibility as we move through the presentation. Next slide. All right, so when we're talking about enhancing accessibility, we're talking about that in a number of different facets. So um, at the very base of it, we're providing communication that is clear, consistent, and easy to understand. And we're also providing communication in multiple formats so all people have access. And again, we'll be talking about what some of those different mediums are as we move through the presentation. We also wanna provide information that is proactive and easy to find. We wanna provide all people access to information and actions that impact their daily lives. And we want to provide multiple tools and ways for people to engage. So as we're thinking about accessibility, as we're thinking about accessibility, all of these different points are, are taken into consideration with uh, how we deliver information and invite people into conversations. Next slide. All right, so in today's presentation, we're gonna do two things. I'm gonna go over an overview uh, with where we are with access to de decision-making through three paths. So the first path is access through engagement efforts of city departments then access through boards and commissions and access through city council. So there's, there's three categories that we'll be looking at. And as we talk about the things we're doing within each of those categories, we've noted where we have a current practice, where we have a current practice in place, but we know it needs improvement or um, better consistency. And then the third area, we, we've identified areas where we know that there are challenges and longer term solutions are likely in those areas. So that's, that's the first part of the presentation. And then the second part, we'll be talking about our continuous improvement and opportunities moving forward. Next slide. So I'll pause there. That's kind of the big overview. I guess the anticipation is there for what's to come. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions before we dive into the details? All right, seeing none, we can move on, Jenna. All right, so access at the city department level. Next slide. So here is here in this part of the presentation, I'm gonna be going through uh, different practices that we currently have in place. And as I shared before, kind of where we are with each of them. So the first one is our website project pages. So on the front page of the city's website, you can get to city projects and initiatives. And hopefully within two and no more than three clicks, you can get to the different projects or public engagement efforts that are underway to participate and or simply be informed. So some of the accessibility um, facets that we have that are related to the project pages are we've got alt, alt text, which describes images for people with visual impairments. Um, as with all of our website pages, translation uh, base level is available uh, through a Google plugin. We also, in our project pages have an effort, and this is an area where we have a process in place and we know that there are opportunities for more consistency across the organization. And that is how we frame information. Our goal is to be really clear with each of our projects about what's happening now to give good background for our community members so that they can see how we got to this point of this being a project to begin with, and then a timeline. So our community knows when to expect uh, certain things might be happening on the ground and or if there are opportunities to engage on any decision making that is related to that project. So in the area of where we know that we, we've got uh, some challenges that need to be addressed, the first is that we know that the way we are currently linking to documents, those being in a PDF format, presents challenges. And so staff has been looking at certain um, 
solutions to how we address that. And, and it's, it is something that is still being researched. Multiple options are being um, considered as, as we look to address that challenge. The second challenge is that we've got a decentralized approach to posting meeting materials. And, and what that means is that we've got uh, staff across all departments that are posting materials to our project pages. Uh, we've got project managers, we've got administrative staff, and while we are working hard to make sure that everybody has training for uh, presenting information, on the website in an accessible way, we know that we've still got improvement. And, and with different staff members managing different projects and administrative staff turning over, it, it is a challenge to make sure that with all of the different pages we have that are um, committed to communicating about projects to make sure that that's being done consistently. So that's our website project pages. And I did speak a little bit about the website in general. Uh, next slide, please. Now we'll talk about our engagement hub. So some things we currently have in place that are available to all is that we've got base level translation built in to our engagement hub. Uh, through that hub, we have the opportunity to engage by phone or online. So again, these are department level engagements that we're talking about. So it might be a project where we're seeking uh, public input, a community meeting, so those, those opportunities exist. Then we've also got the alt text for images for people with visual impairments. Areas uh, where we know that uh, we've got a system in place that needs to be um, addressed for consistency is uh, in this area of being very clear about what the decision to be made is for the engagement, who will make the final decision, and then us reporting back how the input informed the decision that was made. So again, these are project level engagements that we're talking about. Uh, we, we know we've got an opportunity to be more accessible to our community when we have this rhythm that they can understand, that they see across every single department and how we communicate about the decisions to be made. Uh, areas that, that we know are challenges that will be um, that have a longer term solution associated with them are again the supporting materials being in PDF format and that decentralized approach to posting meeting materials. So next slide. Social media. Uh, that's another important tool that we use to engage or inform at the very least our community. Within our communication portfolio, as, as we shared at the very beginning of the presentation, our goal is to make sure that we've got multiple platforms so that we can meet people where they are. We know people are on social media, and so we want to do our best to communicate information and then provide links for folks to come back to any of our online engagement and participate in that project level uh, community engagement. Next slide. All right, so we're, we're moving out of the technology world with how we uh, engage and, and provide access to both staff and decision-making. This, again, at the department level, we're moving into the in-person. So we really do believe that we as an organization, that relationships are where we can have our greatest impact in our community and managing those relationships and sustaining them are really important. So in-person neighborhood and community meetings are another way where we provide accessibility to both staff and uh, decision making. So we currently have a practice in place this is pre-COVID, it's hard to remember the world before COVID, but our standard operating procedure that was in place was that when we have an in-person, citywide, city-sponsored meeting, we will automatically provide Spanish interpretation and child care services. And that speaks to some of the challenges that we know people experience in being able to participate in government, those being child care, transportation, um, different work hour schedules that might limit people's ability to participate in say a five o'clock meeting or a noon meeting. 
um, recognizing that those barriers are in place for some, that, that standard operating procedure was, was put into place. So in the area of we've got a system in place and it needs some more work, uh, we are exploring options for hybrid meeting opportunities to broaden community reach. And again, that's for project-based uh, meetings, community meetings that we're talking about there. Again, that's to provide more access through phone if folks have a barrier of technology and or any of those barriers to participating in person. Um, we, we have... We have contracts in place to provide translated materials. And, and I would say that as an organization, we've, we've still got opportunities to just put that into a standard practice. So it looks the same across every department, whether that's defining a threshold when that must be done, or if it's through the development of um, a communication and engagement plan where we've identified the need for those materials. We know we've got some more work to figure out exactly how to execute that across all departments for our community. Um, and then another area is the consistent formatting and outreach for planned neighborhood commu and community meetings. So right now that's all led by the development of a communication and engagement plan. Uh, communication and public engagement staff do that in partnership with the part the departments that they serve. So what that looks like in practice would be sitting down with the project manager or project sponsor and working through, you know, who is most impacted by this project or this decision, um, who is adjacent to it, who is passionate, who's participated before, and what are their preferred communication methods, and then all of us doing our best to make sure that we're reaching out again through those multiple channels to connect with people in as many possible ways as we can. Uh, an area where we know there's a challenge is in the consistent documentation of neighborhood and community meeting outcomes. Again, that's really important for that piece for being able to report back to our community on what decisions were made and how they were arrived and how the input that our community took the time to give uh, was how it informed whatever that final decision is. So that documentation is uh for on the outcome level is an area where, where we've identified we need some work and will require a longer term solution. All right, next slide. Virtual neighborhood and community meetings. Um, so, so we're moving from in-person to virtual. We've got, we've had a lot of practice with virtual meetings. We're in one right now, thanks to COVID. I guess if anything, there's a silver lining to this madness that we've been in these last two and a half years. Uh, with virtual meetings, again, this is at the neighborhood and community meeting level. Streaming allows for translation through closed captioning. So, so that that is really great. There are many languages to choose from. Um, Again, it mitigates common barriers to participation, such as transportation, childcare, and non-traditional work hours. Uh, we have the opportunity to engage through email and phone through this method as well. Some resources we have in place that have not yet had the chance to operationalize would be the last mile translation. So we do have some high level translation that goes on in the back end of our uh, public input platform. Um, and, and through that, uh, we do have the opportunity to take that and then actually it's machine done. So then to be able to give that to an actual individual to read through and make sure that the um, artificial intelligence that was used to translate that and provide a copy of what was shared is something that, uh, that we can take advantage of in the short to midterm. Um, again, hybrid meetings uh, offer the opportunities to broaden community reach. So explore, we, we've done a base level exploration of hybrid meetings. We know that they are the most, um, they are the most labor intensive to produce. 
there are things with hybrid meetings that, well, if they require more staff and we need to make sure that we've got the right technology in place so that we don't inadvertently negatively impact accessibility by people not being able to hear if we don't have good AV equipment or the sound quality is not well enough so that it can be translated, those types of things. So and moving into the challenges that we, we know exist and will be longer term solutions, sign language interpretation is an area where, where we know that we are not meeting the mark. And it's certainly something that we have uh, looked into and are looking at ways to be able to incorporate that into our overall engagement program. And then these last two or two that I've, I've already shared, uh, and you can see that they're kind of ever present through all of the different mediums. And that is that we, we've got to address uh, our supporting materials being in PDF format and the challenges we experience with the decentralized approach to posting meeting materials. Next slide. All right, then back to the relationships. So we talked about meetings and now I just wanted to bring to the conversation that there are lots of connections that just happen between community members and staff. That's another way that the city of Asheville is um, honoring its commitment to accessibility. And so I named just a few, these by no means are all of the ways that we connect with community and open that door for that two-way conversation between staff and the community, but that they are some, and that's through our neighborhood services division. That's a division within CAPE, Communication and Public Engagement. Um, again, working with all departments, but that person being a resource that's out there every single day. We've got our planner of the day, which is a resource within our planning and urban design department where the community can um, connect and talk with a planner. There are many stakeholder groups that many departments maintain relationships with. I couldn't even begin to name all of them, but based on the type of work that they do, um, there, are, there are groups that staff regularly reaches out to, to either invite into conversations or to hear feedback where that two-way flow of information is maintained. And then finally, we have our community meetings. So, so while we have these resources in place, Note here again in yellow is this area where we have an um, we have a process in place, and that process could use some um, work so that we're more consistent. And that's reporting back on those decisions and actions that come out of meetings and community conversations. Next slide. Okay, so that was department level access points. It's by no means every single way that there are opportunities to engage, um, but it's a high level overview of some of the ones we're working through every day. Does anybody have any questions about any of those? Yes, Councilmember Roney. Thank you so much for your time and attention on this, Dawa. I just wanted to say, um, after years of attending meetings with um, many neighbors and friends um, and serving on boards and commissions myself, um, I served with four members of our community on the transit committee um, that were blind and vision impaired. And I think about um, when accessibility movement says nothing about us without us is for us. Um, I see some of the concerns that have been brought up addressed here. And that's great because that means that we're hearing and we're responding. Um, it's a great start. So some of the questions I have to start with are, I see that direction is needed and I appreciate acknowledgement of challenges and areas that need improvement or consistency. So when someone is participating either through a public meeting or attempting to um, engage through public documents and they run into a barrier, what can they do so that the outreach can be consistent and the response as well? Thank you, council member, for that, for that question. One way 
people can make sure that their challenge is her, is recorded and heard is there is a email address at the bottom of the city's web page. If you scroll all the, if, um, if any community, community member uh, scrolls all the way down to the bottom of that page under accessibility, there is a link um, to an email address. One, this one is for actually Brad Stein, who's our ADA Title II coordinator. That, that's one access point. There's also an email address for the website manager on the bottom of that web page. So emailing that would also create a record. And then as we continue to improve and report back, you know, how issues have been addressed or where they might be in the queue for being addressed, because we all know that we are limited by staff resources and financial resources. So all of those things are taken into consideration as priorities are identified for each uh, for each fiscal year. Um, but I, I think that having a record of that is, is certainly going to be a really important piece of us being able to be accountable to our community when challenges are identified. So those are two ways. Um, certainly if it is, if, uh, if the accessibility issue is in the area of a community meeting, uh, Calling or emailing our neighborhood services division is a great opportunity, and that's just neighborhoods at ashevillenc.gov. Again, it's recorded if that happens, and I'm certainly happy to take any phone call anytime if anybody has questions or um, would like to share some challenges they've experienced with accessibility through any of those mediums. Thank you, Dawa. I appreciate that. So I wonder what it might look like if in order to not get a scattered response, what could it look like to have one of those emails um, sort of like neighborhoods at um, for an engagement at? Maybe we already have one so that no matter who the person is, we have a consistent flow of information. Does that already exist? Well, we don't have an engage, it's not specifically an engagement at AshevilleNC.gov, but but the example you gave, uh, and, and this is something that we're going to talk about a little bit later in the presentation, and I'm happy to bring it up here, um, recognizing, right, that the scatter, the scattered responses makes it really hard for us to understand and track everything that we've heard. So knowing that that is a challenge uh, it is something that we heard through the city's efforts to reimagine public safety. And it is also something that was identified in the equity assessment as an area that needs improvement. And so based off of those two things and council's priority of reimagining public safety this year, one of the big important goals that our department has committed to is the creation of an engagement and stakeholder database. So that's a project that's been, um, we've been working through this fiscal year. It, at least the first iteration of it will be completed by June 30th. And it's trying to speak to just what you're saying. How do we take all of the incoming and um, funnel it into one system that is accessible to all staff that's one facet of this project. So, so if some, what it would look like in practice is if something is tagged as engagement within that system, then anybody, it could be me, it could be somebody in community and economic development, they could go in and see what those challenges are. And it's not just living in one person's email box. Okay. And then I'm thinking about um, the number of times that I've heard someone express a lack of access to um, handicap parking or being able to walk into a room and have a chair that they can sit in. Um, I'm thinking about just infrastructure. There's a lot of attention departmentally on the websites, but I'm, I think we might be missing an opportunity to look at the infrastructure of a public meeting. What happens when someone is trying to attend a meeting, but the um, closest bus stop is more than a 
a quarter mile away. Um, I've seen us do shuttles sometimes, not all the time. Um, what if it, the meeting goes after seven o'clock and 30% of the transit routes end at 7.30? So all of that I think could fit under an umbrella of meeting infrastructure and making sure that folks can come to the meeting and also get back home and that when they're in the meeting, they can participate. Um, so that just seems like one bucket that of a, a whole slide that might be missing if we're looking at this uh, and missing the infrastructure. And then um, lastly, in this departmental part, I was thinking about um, starting with that place where we can be consistent. Um, and one of the big ones seems to be documents. So I'm gonna share a story from about three years ago where a, a staff presentation comes up on the display in the city hall and the council chambers. And a group of people are sitting um, when you walk in on the left-hand side facing the council. And we've never seen this document before. It wasn't available in advance on the agenda. And it's only a picture. So it's not copy and pasteable. It's not accessible for translation. Um, the people on the other side of the room couldn't see it. So then you've got all these arms go up in the air and everyone's taking pictures and some people are typing out the language to try to send the information to people in the room. So while we're looking at that infrastructure, if we could also look at the way that documents are received, um, and I appreciate that PDF addressing, and also it's been just a huge benefit to me as a council member today to be able to have PDF searchable documents instead of just pictures. So I've seen that we can make that change and how big of a help it is for me. And so I wonder, would that also be a benefit for staff, for the people who are advising on boards and commissions and for the public? So right now I'm landing it like infrastructure for the meeting when people participate and the documents for all of us. Absolutely. Yes, all points, all points very well taken and noted. All right, are there any other questions? And thank you again, Council Member Roney for those questions or those questions and sharing those stories, right? Stories are um, impactful. All right, no other questions and I will move along. All right, so access at the board and commission level, uh, I, I do uh, have, just wanna note that I've got Sarah Gross on the phone call if there's any detailed questions that anybody has about this portion of it, but we're gonna move from kind of the department level access to information to the beginning of the policy making access uh, to information. And we're, we're gonna start at the board and commission level. So next slide, please. All right, so virtual meetings. Uh, we're going to follow the same format as before. Uh, COVID, again, has given us this opportunity along with many other challenges, but we'll start first with the opportunities, and that is things you've heard before. Streaming allows for translation, uh, and it mitigates common barriers to participation, such as tra uh, transportation, child care, and non-traditional work hours. And then again, there's that opportunity to engage through email and phone. So that could even be, you know, ahead of a meeting, leaving a voicemail. I didn't mention that before, but that is an, uh, an important opportunity that folks have. And, and the ability to email uh, council uh, or board and um, board chairs and boards so that they've got that information ahead of their meeting. Um, areas where we know that there are challenges. Again, you all have seen these, but they are sign language interpretation, links to uh, supporting materials being in PDF format. That's the challenge that they're in PDF format. <clears throat> and then that decentralized approach to posting meeting materials. Um, and, and I will say, so, where we have this, it's the similar challenge in, in that uh, decentralized approach in that we've got so many different people that are posting information and they're not doing it frequently. Sometimes some of the standard operating procedure and that consistency can be negatively impacted. Next slide. All right, now for each board and commission, there is a web page. 
and where uh, we've got a process in place that is having a board description, staff contact information, the upcoming meeting packet, and past agendas and meeting minutes, having all of those available and consistent for each of the board and commissions. That, that, that um, template is in place. Uh, an opportunity that, that we are aware of and um, we have the resources to correct right now would be with how the meeting the, the meeting schedules are coordinated. We know that there's an opportunity to better integrate that information with other calendars that we have on the website. So you can absolutely go to every board and commission page and see when that board and commission meets. And there are how many, Sarah? We're going to say 30 plus. 30. Okay. So we we know that there are 30 plus. So that, that's a lot of clicks to try to figure out when, you know, a certain board or commission meeting is scheduled <clears throat> and then trying to understand which board or commission might have the information that you're interested in is, is another challenge um, that, that we also experience. But, but to be able to go to the front page of the website and within two clicks be able to get to when any border commission is meeting is is what we are we're looking into right now we just have two systems that aren't yet talking to each other so want to make an improvement in that area um longer term challenges are the same uh, supporting materials being in PDF format, and then the decentralized approach uh, for the information that is posted on those pages definitely presents challenge. All right, next slide. That may be it for boards and commissions. Okay, I'll pause there. Anybody have any questions for boards and commissions? This is Kim. I'll just go ahead and lift up that I know that we've lost um, opportunities to receive advice from boards and commission members who decided not to stay um, when we weren't able to provide sign language services. Um, so I'm glad that it's named here and I hope that we have an opportunity to follow up um, with meaningful response soon. Council member Whistler. Um, this is probably not specifically to boards and commissions, but um, one question that I have is, you know, if we're exploring hybrid meetings, how does how do you prioritize a, a person who's in person versus a person that is virtual? So for example, um, you know, if, if the particular uh, body has a, a rule or a, you know, whatever you call it, um, of like public comment is limited to an hour. So how, how does one um, decide, well, do you give priority to somebody who came to the meeting or do you give priority to someone who calls in? And, and how is that kind of thing considered or thought about? Thank you. Thank you for that question. And it, and it really speaks to why we think that it's important to explore hybrid meetings at the community meeting level first. There are, there are lots of questions that need to be answered um, before we would ad recommend or advise implementing that at a policymaking level. And that's not to say that community meetings aren't important. Um, they just tend not to have as many restraints as a formal, you know, board commission, council committee, council meeting, and and we've got more opportunity to um, hear and learn and address those needs before we take it to that next level. So, in short, the answer is I don't know yet, but it is definitely something that should be. Um, explored and, and considered in a thoughtful way before we would take it to an area where there might be some kind of council action associated with it. Councilmember Roney. So what might it look like if we're going to look at prioritization of a way that a person shows up to do an equity assessment to ensure that we're not prioritizing people who have the most access to say transportation, childcare, et cetera? 
just because someone who doesn't have access to as many resources uh, right. is participating in a different way. What would it look like for us to make that assessment before we make that decision? Literally, what would it look like? Or well, I, I would imagine that it would be part of our part of our assessment that we do as we learn at the community meeting level and certainly done in partnership with our uh, equity and inclusion department and reaching out. I, I feel confident in saying this, that we would reach out <clears throat> to groups that have been identified as being missing from conversations and or who we know have identified barriers to participation, being very intentional about reaching out to them and getting their input as we come up with a recommendation moving moving forward. Did well, I answer? Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, so am I jumping the gun, Dawa, to talk about the, um, the outreach uh, database that yeah. CAPE is working on? Am, am, I, am I jumping the gun a little bit or you can talk about that later or? No, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it now. I, I'm a big fan of um, momentum, right? And, and, and rather than being, you know, theoretical and all of, all of this to show examples. And this would be an example. So earlier I talked about one facet of the engagement database project being staff's ability to go see what people have heard or have said, right? And that's where things are tagged and any staff member can see what community has said about different issues. It could be accessibility, it could be about greenways, it could be about many things. The other facet of this project is the stakeholder database portion of the project. And that is where we will have the opportunity to invite the community in to tell us what they um, want to hear more about, what they're interested in. And um, I won't get too, I don't wanna get too deep into the details during you, you all's time, If you, but I'm happy, I'm happy to go as deep into the details with what we know now as you all would like, but, generally what what it's gonna what we believe it's gonna look like and again we're just in project execution stage the beginnings of it is that folks could sign up and self-identify with any way that they identify so it could be age it could be race it could be what they're interested in and then we will and that will on the back end of the system, connect them to different distribution groups. So if we have a if we have a decision to be made, maybe it's a project decision, and we know that one of the gr groups that will be most impacted will be people with visual impairments, we can start there, and we can do very intentional outreach to those groups. Right, because hopefully along that way, we're learning, in addition to that there's interest, what the preferred methods of communication are. So this doesn't, it doesn't have to rely only on people signing up online. We expect that there will be a push where we are out in community and we're collecting this information face-to-face -face as well, right? But it will all be in a place where we can say, okay, here, here's a group of people who have said they have, they have signed up, if you will, to, to get information about these things. And then that gives us the ability to go out and do better outreach and make sure that we're as inclusive as we can for all of the different groups that we may wanna reach in any given issue. Is that enough detail about that piece of the database for this question? I would just I would appreciate seeing any other information about that where where it started how it's going what is the end goal yes ha happy to happy to and again we are very early 
in, in that process. And there will certainly be much more. There will be a marketing campaign around it. And, and I'm happy to give updates to council on where we are with that project as it as it continues to, to evolve. But I, I will say that June 30th is the date that we have put in place to have this first iteration. We imagine there will be things that we will learn along the way and we'll want to keep improving it and updating it. Um, but June 30 is that is that hard date that we've set for ourselves for project implementation. And um, Dawa, we anticipate that this will be a lot more robust. I mean, right now you can sign up to say, I want um, I want notifications of all the meetings about HCD or you know whatever. It'll be a lot more robust than that. That um, I can't even remember what we call that list, but um, it'll it will not only include individuals, but it will include organizations that have said that they are interested in a particular um, issue, et cetera, or um, even have expertise that we, that the city uh, can reach out to and, and say, you know, we know that you're very knowledgeable about this um, and can you lend a hand, lend your expertise to a particular issue? Is that correct? That is, that is correct. That is correct. That is correct. And, and again, we're still there. There are, We expect that there will be more. Honestly, that facet of it really came up through the um, boards and commission focus groups as, as that, um, that effort is underway. And we identified that as an opportunity. And we expect that as, as things continue to move forward, that we're just going to keep hearing more opportunities and be able to integrate all of these things so that, that all staff can be working in a more inclusive way. Instead of one person having a distribution list through their email, then they leave the organization, then all of those connections and contacts are gone and we're starting back over from scratch. So this is really about creating, uh, to, uh, to I guess it's really about supporting institutional knowledge and, and we hope that it will um, address some of the um, fatigue we have certainly heard over the years that our community feels with respect to engagement, right? So if you said something at a meeting about um, transportation that had to do with parks, we don't want to lose that. And this is that opportunity. Sorry, I switched back to the input piece of it, but it's related here. Um, it, it's really all about not losing knowledge. And Della, really quick, if I may, getting back to Council Member Whistler's earlier question regarding how would we handle a potential scenario where you've got public input for people calling in versus coming in person to the meetings. We're obviously not the only municipality or governmental entity that's dealing with this issue right now. So we've actually got Jenna and Jamie on our team pulling other local governments across the state on how they're handling that issue. And as soon as that, as we have that research concluded, um, we'll come back to you just so that you have kind of an environmental scan of what's happening across the state in this space. All right, fantastic. And, and yes, across, across the state and, and across the country, um, there there was there was a Route 55 article that we contributed to that had a number of uh, different experiences across the country of different cities and how they're grappling with this challenge of hybrid meetings. All right, next slide. So city council level, now we're moving into the city council level of um, access. So next slide, please. All right, so virtual council committee meetings. Um, those are, and this was pre-COVID, we had already moved to a place where we were streaming them to YouTube. And now since COVID, we now have the engagement hub. So they're, they're going to both places. The closed caption translation is available through the stream. It mitigates the, some, of the, some of the common barriers to participation like transportation, childcare, non-traditional work hours. And then again, there's the opportunity uh, to engage through email, phone, and phone with no sign up for public comment. So 
um, that's different than our virtual city council meetings. This is related to city council committee meetings. Um, areas where we know we have challenges, sign language interpretation, and then again, supporting materials being in PDF formats. Next slide. Our, our in-person city council committee meetings um, are were, again, they were streamed to YouTube before we started going virtual. And then that streaming allows for translation. So that was an accessibility improvement that we implemented a few years ago. Challenges, sign language interpretation and supporting materials in PDF format. Next slide. Virtual, all right, so now we're moving into virtual city council meetings. The, the apex of the, the most critical policy decision-making meetings that we have. They are broadcast to our government television station. They are also streamed to YouTube and to the engagement hub. The closed caption translation is available through the stream. Um, the virtual meetings mitigate some of the common barriers we are aware of. And then there is the, the opportunity to engage through email and phone. So email prior to the meeting, phone during the meeting with sign up required. Challenges, sign language interpretation, and then again, supporting materials being in PDF format. Next slide. Okay, city council meetings in person. Um, they are also broadcast to the government TV. They are also streamed to YouTube, which allows for closed caption translation. And then the council chamber is equipped with an audio induction loop for people with hearing impairment. Challenges we know that exist are that we don't have sign language interpretation and the supporting materials, at least some are in PDF format. Next slide. All right, so since we started with staff and operational decision-making and moved up to access uh, for policy decision-making at the council level, I thought it might be helpful to share the following flow chart for policy decisions. So of course at the, well, maybe we'll start at the, we'll start at the top. So elected officials are established, or elected officials establish city policies and appoint a city manager to oversee the day-to-day -day operations. Um, the city manager then oversees the operations through uh, city staff. Then from our city, our full city council, we have council committees and they are groups of three members of the city council and they review policy matters referred to them and make recommendations to the full council for adoption. And then We've got advisory, board, uh, advisory boards that fold up to council committees. They are created by city council. Um, they're residents that are appointed and they provide input on the policies that shape their government and our city. Each advisory board has a council liaison who is responsible for providing the full council with recommendations. And likewise, informing the advisory board, going back the other direction, on city council initiatives and priorities. So those advisory boards, um, city uh, boards and commissions, if you will, are supported by department staff and uh, the staff that are appointed to support those boards are appointed by the city manager. Yes, Ms. yes, council member Whistler. Thanks, Noah. Um, so just to, uh, I mean, you know, this is kind of, uh, feels a little bit like government 101, which is great. Um, I think that's important. Um, these advisory boards, to clarify, are to advise city council. They are not to advise city staff. Um, I mean, they are, they are basically uh, created by city council and for city council's um, purpose to basically, um, you know, have residents who are, uh, experts or interested or whatever in a particular um, idea, but um, they are not created to um, advise staff at all. Right? Thanks. Yep, that, that, is, that, is, that is correct. And, and while staff support board and commissions, 
um, as far as um, posting of materials in a decentralized manner, which does provide challenges for consistency. Working groups do not have staff that are appointed to support them in that way. So, so, so under advisory boards, there are working groups that are created by boards or commissions, and, and their job is to focus on a specific task or research. So those working groups are not public bodies, and they are not, again, supported by staff. All right. So I appreciate that opportunity. I do know it was definitely Government 101, but, but I know that the way this presentation was flowing, we were talking about staff, then we were talking about boards and commissions, and then we were talking about council. I thought it might be helpful to just have this visual to, for our um, watching community to, to reflect upon. All right, next slide. Any questions there before we move into the next section? All right, I don't see any. Okay, so I think this is this is the good stuff. I think um, these are the opportunities for continuous improvement. Next slide. All right, so reflecting back on all of those yellow boxes, just to put them all together on one slide for for clear communication, um, we have a process in place where we are trying to communicate information about projects consistently, and that is. What's happening now? What's the background? What's the timeline? We know we've got some um, room for growth in doing that consistently across the board. Same with the framing of our engagement options, right? So anytime we're asking for community input, what we're aiming for is to be very clear, accessible accessibility through clear language and what naming what the decision to be made is, communicating who will make the final decision, and then reporting back how the input that we received from the community informed the decision. So what that would look like if we were just A plus would be that any, any of our public engagement efforts, you could go to a project page and you could see that very clearly. And if you participated, you would have received a communication sharing that information with you after the decision was made. Uh, so other, other opportunities that are in place um, that need some attention if we're going to implement would be the options for hybrid neighborhood and community meetings. That last mile translation I mentioned earlier, providing translated materials consistently um, at a certain, at some determined threshold or through some determined process consistent formatting and outreach for planned neighborhood and community meetings, and then reporting back on decisions and actions from community meetings and community conversations. And then again, commuting the board, uh, communicating the board and commission meeting schedule. That was that calendar opportunity that we discussed earlier. Next slide. All right, so, so the longer ones, the ones that are, that, that, kind of need to be um, prioritized and, and um, scoped out as a project from beginning to end. They may need additional resources. That's why they're in this category. So one is consistently providing um, supporting materials in a searchable and accessible format all the time. Addressing this decentralized approach to posting materials, and that is both project-based at the department level and board and commission-based. Uh, providing consistent documentation of neighborhood and community meeting outcomes, and then making sign language interpretation available. Next slide. All right. That was a lot of information. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to circle back to what the key takeaways uh, are within all of that information, and that is that the city is committed to inclusive decision making and that making information accessible is a guiding principle. There are many outlets for public engagement that's intentional, multiple channels for people, and that staff is committed to continuously improving options to enhance access to government with several short-term and longer-term efforts currently underway. 
Thank you all for letting me share all of that information. Are there any questions? This is Kim, I have a few. So Dawa, when we had an opportunity to meet um, the last week of the year um, with staff and community partners, um, I had originally asked for this agenda item for the governance committee so that we could start a conversation around improving our public meeting process and our document accessibility. And I'm so um, appreciative of the way that you have laid this out in a way that we can come back to it and say, here are the things that we've learned from, here are the things that we're doing better at, we still need to work on these and we learn new things we're gonna add to it. Um, so that is just brilliant, thank you. Um, I also feel that ironically, we have created a barrier in this meeting um, by not inviting our community partners to present. So for example, if we were working on an affordable housing development with a developer of land, we would be hearing a presentation about that development from the person who developed it. And through years of public engagement and input, um, years of lived and professional experience about how this could be better, we have community partners through Code for Asheville who have presented a policy development and we aren't gonna be able to hear from them today in a way that we'll be able to inform because when we put things in the public comment period, like we did with our stormwater task force report at our last council meeting, it can have glitches, it can get cut off, but we're not supposed to respond. Um, and I think this is a deserving of a response. I hear a lot of folks come in public comment that have ideas or concerns, but the majority of their engagement is around how hard it was to engage or the process of that engagement. And so I'm curious before we make a policy recommendation to the full council and continue this conversation, how we can bring those policy developers to the table and so other folks can add to it, just like we can kind of sync up our lists of things that we're doing well, things we can do better and see if those some of those match um, and we might be missing things. So once again, nothing about us without us is for us. If we try to develop this policy any further without the people who are having the issue and presenting the solutions, then it's, we're doing a disservice to ourselves in the community, in my opinion. Um, so I, for one, would love to hear a follow-up conversation about this, maybe in March, um, with that policy development presentation included. That was, I assume, probably more directed at committee members. Um, and it's true, we do have groups, volunteer groups in the community that at times put together fantastic presentations that they would like to provide to council and they either send them to us by email or do very creative uh, sequence presentations during the public comment period um, or ask to meet with us individually to talk about whatever it is their recommendations are. And if, Dawa, if your group's gonna be looking kind of holistically about um, you know, how to, to incorporate or have some kind of platform for folks that have gone to great lengths to put together in-depth pieces of information that don't fit neatly into three minutes. Um, you know, I think that's, I think that, you know, obviously you can, you're looking at the whole picture. So you're likely to look at that. Um, you know, and I think, I think we struggle with how to balance the job and role of the elected officials with the staff and moving things through our committee subcommittee process and on, eventually on to council um, and making and, and you know meeting the literal statutory requirements but then also um, meaningfully incorporate public input into our process without crushing it. it you know you don't want to create a system where you can't then you know it's so overburdened you can't move it forward and I, I know we're kind of trying to figure that out we're really lucky in that we have a lot of folks in the community that want to participate so that's a great thing and we have to figure out how to best leverage it you know I've had the chance to talk with mayors of large cities across the state about how they are handling um, public comment and Generally speaking, we're incredibly generous um, compared compared to them. So I feel like we're doing something right. Um, we're obviously not, you know, we're obviously continuing to do better. Um, 
but you know, I, I know, for example, the city of Charlotte only allows public input once a month, even though they meet several times a month. Um, I know that um, the city of Winston-Salem prioritizes city residents and, and doesn't um, bring in, from what I understand, um, speakers from outside the city. Uh, anyway, so time limitations, geographic limitations, things like that. And we're trying not to operate in that space, but we're also trying to continue to make it available for as many people as possible and continuing to make the wheels turn, so to speak. So could I receive a yes or no? I'm okay with hearing a no. I just think that we're going to have to hear uh, something because the email threads that have been going on around this are um, cyclical. And this isn't just for our community groups, but also for our advisory boards. We have advisory boards in the past who have made um, presentations to council in our live meetings. Are we going to be able to go back to that? Is the answer no? Um, those are some of the things that I feel like we might be just as you know, electeds putting our staff in a tricky spot of it being expected to respond um, when we might just have to go ahead and say there's not an appetite to hear a presentation on the tree canopy, the stormwater ordinance, or a policy um, development around public engagement. Those are hard conversations to have around resources like time. Um, but I do think that uh, that's part of the conversation that we can have here. What is, what is it that you want to say yes or no? I, I wasn't clear. Well, we could start with um, hearing a uh, presentation from policy development from Code for Asheville at our next meeting or a future meeting of the Governance Committee. But additionally, I am inclined to ask if we will be able to hear advisory board presentations at future council meetings um, because we are hearing no's right now. Um, and if, for example, an advisory board, we had 18 advisory boards present 30 recommendations to council in writing last year. What does it look like if one of them were to request a presentation to council with urgent information, say before a retreat? Um, if they land in the public comment period, they have three minutes and we're not meant to respond. So are we going to do what we've done in the past and allow advisory boards to present to council during the meeting as, as an agenda item? Or is the limitation going to be public comment at the end of the meeting. I think actually um, that the idea... Hey, Gwen, I can't hear you very well. Can you... Um, lean? Okay, sorry. Well, I have this on, so shouldn't have to lean. But um, uh, it's my understanding that the annual reports that boards and commissions give to city council um, is the is one of the avenues to get those recommendations. And um, typically we discuss those recommendations at the at the retreat, at the council retreat. Um, and I've specifically asked that we make sure that is added to that we make sure that that's on the agenda at the retreat. Um, just I guess to echo what um, the mayor said is uh, from the standpoint of envisioning that between now and the retreat that we would have 30 advisory boards come in front of city council seems um, burdensome given that uh, they will have an opportunity to uh, fill out annual reports and present those recommendations to council and I'm assuming that all council members read those and again that we'll discuss them at the retreat. So I hear that as a no we are not going to have our advisory boards present to council that we are going to use strictly the in writing um, report. Okay as long as that's an agreement and we're going to apply that across the board. Um, yeah, then... I'm not I'm not necessarily saying I'm agreeing or not agreeing to that we don't have a written policy about it and there are times where advisory boards have made presentations under the presentation portion of the agenda. I don't know why you'd want to cut off that opportunity for council to ask for that if we need to do it. We are currently cutting off that opportunity because I know that recently we have declined the Urban Forestry Commission and Stormwater from presenting on the agenda. So I'm just making sure that if we have information. Stormwater is not our appointed task force. They were a self-appointed task force. So. Of which I'm the liaison. So I just. 
we appointed members to that. I, I, we can get into the nitty gritty of the details. No, I'm just giving we, examples we, because- We did not appoint members to that. We did not. Are you talking okay. about- in, in general, look, let's go back to the Urban Forestry Commission. Urban I mean, Forestry Commission could have easily presented. There are definitely times where we've had boards and commissions present under presentations. I, I, I don't know why I, I, I could foresee a, a time when that might happen again. Um, if council wanted to hear a presentation from a board or commission under presentations, of course, when we go back to in-person meetings, which we're going to do at our next meeting, we'll open back up the opportunity for groups to give 10 minute presentations. So there, there'll be that increased opportunity, which we haven't been able to do during virtual meetings. So it's absolutely not my intention to stop having an opportunity for boards and commissions and advisory boards to present during meetings, but it is my intention to go ahead and have something that is reliable and consistent in writing. And it could be part of something like this policy where anytime that someone needs to give a presentation, they have a clear pathway to do that. We have a clear expectation and it's not that scattered approach where it depends on who you talk to there's just a path to do it and there's a way and there's the infrastructure to do it. Okay. Well that, I mean, that policy chain, well, there isn't a policy. So I, you know, if there's going to be an adoption of a formal policy it would have to happen at a council level. So I mean, this committee isn't going to, isn't going to change that today. So it sounds like we need to have another ongoing conversation and follow up to this one, which is exactly what I would hope we could do in March. I think Dala, what, what's your return time? Are you going to be ready in March? Well, so I may need one point of, of clarity on this. Real, this presentation today was was really a report out on the operational end of what we're doing just as part of our typical work plans across the city. Um, so I, I guess I- uh, You're just giving us kind of a, a status update. You didn't plan, you're not planning to come back to us uh, to, in, in the immediate future. Right, right. Or, or to recommend, just because this is in the operational realm, realm of things that that, that was the intent you, to to present Bella, it as you, a, proposing a policy so the intent was not to propose a policy today right. but said report out on operations are you are you going to come forward um I, and i can't recall and i'm sorry are you going to be coming under the manager's report for neighborhood matching grant tonight no for, <laughs> for this discussion that we're having in this committee meeting are you slated to come forward at some point under the manager's report? Uh, no, I'm. No, okay. Rachel, you're, yeah. you're not aware that you are. You are probably not. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm trying to think, Kim, when you could, you know, I think you could speak with your fellow council members and see if there's an interest in adopting some kind of formal policy about when and how we hear from boards and commissions, other than the system we've been using for the last many years. Um, or, I mean, also with a, in a parallel way, there's this conversation having we're having right now about um, uh, reformatting boards and commissions, which may kind of come together at the same time. And Mayor, if I may, we do have the retreat coming up in March where we're going to be talking about priorities, um, both current year priorities, as well as what you you all as a governing body want staff to focus on for the next year. So that would be an opportunity as we're talking about our priorities across the organization to provide some specific feedback on, do you want staff focusing specifically on the drafting of a policy? To Dawa's point, today's presentation was really more from that operational lens. This is what we're doing. This is where we know we have opportunities for continuous improvement. If you want us to take that next step to policy, I would think that could be something that we would communicate about as we're talking about our priorities during the retreat in March. Okay, and that's going to be March 17th and 18th. I was just looking up the date for those watching. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. Once again, Dawa, I'll just say thank you for outlining this so clearly so that we can sort of like benchmark the seasons um, not unlike we do with basketball season, which is coming up around March Madness. Maybe we'll see years in the future of us gaining some wins on this ground. 
And, and I will say that um, on that operational end, we're back to how the presentation was formatted and it, and it was intentional on that department level, there, there are opportunities for engagement for stakeholder groups, for folks that are interested in certain aspects of what we do. And, and I will speak for my department. I, I'm happy to connect with anyone that's got ideas about how we can improve. Um, and and we we will we'll do what we can if it's something in the short term. And then if it is something that's bigger, requires more resources, then we've got our as uh, Ms. Wood just shared, we've got our annual kind of prioritization process and, and kind of learning what some of the higher priorities would be is always helpful. So that invitation is there at the staff level. Okay, if there's not um, anything else at this point, we do. I think we might have a couple of callers. Jenna, tell me if we do, and if we do, will you please bring them on? Yes, we have two callers. I'll bring the first one on now. Caller ending in 6029, your line is open. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. This is Patrick Conant from East West Asheville. First, I need to clarify that I have personally presented as a member of the public before the Public Safety Committee and full City Council on many occasions. These have all occurred under the presentation portion of the agenda, and each time all that was required was a simple emailed request. I strongly believe that we can work together to increase public participation in our local government. I worked with individuals in our community and subject matter experts from across the state to document a set of best practice solutions in a proposal we have named the Open Meetings Policy. I first proposed the Open Meetings Policy to Council during public comment on December 14th. I met with city staff later that month where they indicated that the core values of the policy aligned with their existing work plan. Our goal is to make a presentation before this committee and receive approval to present before all of city council. Unfortunately, and as council member Roney stated, perhaps ironically, our proposal to improve public meetings remains in limbo because the process to make a presentation before this committee is not operating with integrity. I followed up with the governance committee and staff on January 5th, 27th, and 28th, as well as February 1st, 3rd, and 4th. Council member Roney responded to several of my emails and confirmed that she also made a request to add this presentation as an agenda item. Despite repeated follow-ups, I never received a clear yes or no answer regarding our request to be added to the agenda from the other two members of this committee. When we met in December, the city manager gave me her word that she would ensure my outreach would receive a clear response, but that also has not occurred. The mayor has stated that we can present during public comment, but that format will not work for this proposal. Three minutes is insufficient time to present this information. And a presentation during public comment does not allow for appropriate discussion and feedback from council and staff. If our proposal lacks support, I request the committee members provide specific feedback so that we may determine an appropriate path forward. City staff reviewed our proposal and met with us in December. I find it extremely disappointing that members of this committee have been unwilling to perform the same due diligence. If the city of Asheville is truly committed to inclusive participation in government, then we need to center those most impacted, members of the public. I will repeat our current ask for clarity. We are seeking the opportunity to present the open meetings policy as a formal agenda item at the March meeting of the governance committee. Thank you. Caller ending in 2132, your line is open. Oh, <clears throat> thanks y'all. Uh, this is David Greenson uh, from Montford. Uh, and I appreciate the presentation today and the discussion. Um, I, I, I'm glad that y'all are really thinking about these accessibility issues. I, I wanna raise um, one thing that I just didn't feel like was covered in, in what y'all are working on, which, which pertains to, to my work every week. 
So I, I appreciate the, the attention to the support materials uh, being in a, in a more accessible format. Um, I'd like to talk about how, how much more uh, accessibility would be enhanced if those materials could be made available sooner. So my work these days is primarily with the, the Government Accountability Project, uh, gapavl.org. And what we try to do is just break down what's happening in city and county government week to week. You know, what, what are the things that people should pay attention to, specifically if they want to try to have influence, try to make public comment. And, and the windows for, for engaging people around these things are just so narrow that it's, it's really hard. So I'll give you a, for instance, on, on, on the, the weeks before city council meets, as you all know, uh, I have a team of volunteers that is waiting with <laughs> bated breath for Maggie's email that the agenda is out. And then they, they dive in and they try to analyze the things that are happening and you know try to dis discern which are the most important things, which are things community members are really gonna wanna know about so they can take action on. And you know they work through the weekend. We, we want to try to be diligent and make sure we're, we're getting good information. And if we're lucky, uh, you know we get we get maybe we can get an email out on Monday evening, <laughs> telling people here's what's going to happen tomorrow. When of course it's really almost too late to send it for public comment. We don't even ask people anymore to send us public comment because if our email comes out at eight o'clock at night, they're probably not going to see it until after the nine a.m. deadline. So. I know that you know the county commission. Honestly, they're they're a little better than y'all insofar as their agendas come out on Wednesday instead of Friday. Um, and I know with with boards and commissions, you know, it, it's all over the place as, as Dawa was talking about in terms of the the inconsistency around material sharing. I just I, I, it would make a huge difference in terms of our being able to to responsibly alert the public around what's coming down the pike that they might want to really have influence on if there was a little more lead time because it's just so hard. Uh, I'm, I'm just frankly kind of tired of <laughs> the late nights on Fridays and Mondays trying to, to pull together this report and, and not do a disservice to you all or to the public in terms of misconstruing things. There's a lot of information that comes out, and um, if it could come out earlier, uh, boy, it would make my life easier. And I do think you'd get uh, not just more public engagement, but, but better public engagement because folks would be better informed. Uh, it's just such a small window to try to, to, to get the word out in a responsible way. So. That's the request. Um, thank you all for, for all that you do. Caller ending in 7629, your line is open. Hey there, this is Grace Martinez. Um, I really appreciate the comments of the two previous callers um, and would like to second um, both what they said. Um, you know, I really love about our community that we have a highly engaged community that um, cares deeply about the well being of people who live here. Um, and that's something I really value about living here. And, you know, I've definitely expressed this before, but, uh, you know, we, as we know, this, um, this process is not easy to participate in. Um, and I really appreciate the work of city staff uh, in trying to make it, you know, an easier process. Uh, but I do have concerns as it relates to transparency and to the possibility of removing possibilities for public input through changing any of these um, or eliminating these advisory committees. I would love to. Um, you know, I'm not the most informed on this topic, and I would love to hear more about what Code for Asheville has to say because um, it sounds like they've done a lot of work around this. Um, I I really am concerned that um, perhaps the idea in removing public input is related to the idea that there have been recommendations that have been made by these advisory committees that are not being followed through with city council. Um, I'm thinking specifically about the recommendation to follow the CDC guidelines um, not to remove encampments. And um, as we know, um, we actually have a policy change that's not in writing as the city council or the uh, Citizen Times covered yesterday. Um, so we're having a lot of changes happening in our community. And I think it's more important than it's ever been to hear our community and then to actually follow through with the recommendations of, of what folks are saying in our community. Um, 
as far as going back to in-person meetings, I really look forward to seeing you all in person. Um, but also I have the hope that we would continue to have um, an option for virtual engagement because that really increases accessibility. I think the sign-up deadline for city council is not really acceptable um, as far as the deadline goes. I actually missed it myself um, after having a death in the family. Um, so uh, for tonight's meeting, so I mean, we can do it in this meeting where you can just call in. So I don't see why we couldn't do that for the full council meeting. Um, also, I don't see closed captioning being available on this video. I did try to turn that on. Um, I would propose that we don't actually have a limit on public engagement. As we saw in the last meeting, there were lots of folks uh, who wanted to participate. And I really appreciate that the decision was made to allow those folks to comment. Um, I'm also just curious, I know you don't respond to questions, but whether the um, 30 recommendations that were made by the 18 advisory boards, I was just curious how many of those were adopted. Um, Caller, you're at three minutes. So, okay, thanks for your time. Have a good day. That was our last caller. Okay, thank you. Um, this we've reached the end of our agenda and we don't have any further public comment. Is there any other questions or comments before we adjourn? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dawa and team for presenting today and for providing us with all the information. That was great. All right. Thanks everyone. Have a good day. <laughs>